maybe we will say that video is too graphic on uh, what really um, happened uh, to our Lord Jesus Christ, but we just don't want to miss, you know, what really transpired as what the gospel and the scriptures have narrated in what Jesus truly went through when He suffered for our sake. Uh, it is my duty as your pastor to prepare our hearts for this coming Easter. I know it's just three Sundays uh, from now, so um, we just get right to it. Sometimes we, I guess, miss all of these things because next Sunday, I would like to invite everyone, we will have our uh, Palm Sunday celebration, uh, seven days before Easter. The Sunday before Easter is always our Palm Sunday, and then the Sunday after that, August, uh, I'm sorry, April 16 is our Sunday Easter celebration. But today, we're going to start the series entitled, Jesus is Concerned with Us. And I think this is fitting, and I think this is appropriate for the next series of messages we'll be hearing from our God through this pulpit, that truly God is very much concerned with us. Amen, church? The things that we're going to see, the things that we're going to hear, the things that uh, our hearts will be able to experience in the next few days, in the next few weeks, uh, truly is a testament and a validation of how God truly is concerned with us. And I'd like us to think about this, this first message, the question, why did Jesus suffer? I was talking with my son and and he said, well, you know, for the most part, maybe Jesus didn't have to go through all of this. God is God, and whatever goals, whatever things that he would want to accomplish, he can probably do that without Jesus going through all of these things. Right? Sometimes we cringe whenever we see, I saw some of your expressions, uh, when, when the nail was about to go through the, the palm of our Lord Jesus Christ, you cringed a little bit, right? Because it's, it's so vivid, it's so graphic. Uh, but uh, these are the things that Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, went through when He suffered for, for all of us. Uh, a great preacher in the 1800s, uh, if you know the name Charles Haddon Spurgeon, uh, this is one of our um, resources as a pastor. I always look at the way he framed, the way he con con constructed his sermon. He said, sharing a message is just like throwing a bucket full of water to a row of bottles, right? Bottles. Uh, some will have, you know, will catch the water, but some water will spill on the sides, and not everybody will be able to understand the message. You know, I've been preaching for the last 20 years, and if I would be given a chance, I would really would like to sit uh, with each one of us or each one of you to really explain this message, why did Jesus suffer? And this is a very important message for us uh, to understand, not only during the Easter season or the, the Lent season, but uh, do we really appreciate what God has done for all of us? Do we really feel that Jesus Christ is our Savior daily in our lives? And today, as God would allow us, we will hear an explanation of why Christ died and what it means to us. Why did he, Christ have to go through all of these things, right? Why did He, he has to have to um, be, be scourged? Why did He have to, like, put on the crown of thorns? Why did Jesus Christ carry the cross to Calvary? Right? And why did Jesus have to be crucified on the cross? and eventually breathe His last for the sake of His love for all of us. For us to understand this, I think the premise, right, for us to appreciate what God has done, what Christ has given to all of us, we need to understand the human condition. Right? What it is and why it is that Jesus Christ needs to suffer to die for all of us. If we miss this and we just jump to Easter when Christ resurrected from the grave, uh, the power of resurrection will be pointless and meaningless. We need to understand why Jesus need to suffer. Why did He die for you and for me? And the only way I think the appropriate way to understand this is to look at it from the perspective of who we are, 
what this human condition is about, right? The Bible explains carefully that the human condition is indeed very serious. Um, you might be going through this life and you might be successful. Uh, you might enjoy life as it is because you have a lot of family, you have a lot of friends. But there is this serious point and perspective of who we are as a people that that's, that's the main reason why Christ need or needed to suffer for all of us. What we are in ourselves fundamentally uh, is this condition called total depravity. Right? Uh, what do we mean by this? Uh, Pastor, is this, this is so very discouraging right? it, for you to discuss who we are and, and, and to show us that we are, we are totally de- depraved or the depravity of man. Well, that's the only way we would really appreciate what Jesus did for all of us, the condition of man, of who we are today. Depravity uh, is, is defined as the moral corruption or wickedness. Left to itself or to, to ourselves, man is really corrupt. Uh, we are wicked from what the standard is as God would allow us. But look at this, right? Uh, this is not some sort of a watered-down understanding of what total depravity is. But I think from the perspective of God, this is who we are. Total depravity means not that at every point man is bad as he could be because you might be thinking we are so evil, we are so wicked. No, right? It is not saying that at every point in our lives we are bad or very wicked or very simple or sinful, I mean to say. What total depravity means is that at no point is man as good as we should be. Are we following, church? Right? There is no point in our lives right, that we are as really bad as we are always you know, supposed to be bad. But there is also no point in our lives left to our own, you know, to ourselves. There is no point for man to be as good as we should be. Meaning, in the standard of God, we cannot pass the standard of God. We are not as good as we should be. And there will never be a point in our lives that we are as good as what we should be. I remember a time when, back in high school, just a few years back, I wanted to to be a member of our varsity team. You know, if you are a member of a varsity team, you have this jacket that you have. I I attended an all boys school when I was in high school and just a mile from our high school are all girls high school. If you're familiar with, with Marist School in Marikina, that's in the Philippines and St. Scholastica Marikina so that's all boys all girls, right? So if you are a member of a varsity team and you are wearing that jacket, you are the coolest one of the coolest kids, just like Jared right? Yeah. Or maybe Noah right there, right? Uh, if you're wearing that, uh, that jacket. So I will do everything I can in my power to become a varsity member. I uh, tried out in basketball, but I, I realized that height is might, and I was not very skilled. Bottom line, I'm not as good as I can be to be qualified to be a varsity player. I tried baseball, because baseball, you know, I'm not that tall. I can probably play first base, right? And I realized again, I'm not as good as I should be. So I was not qualified to become a varsity player. To make the long story short, that's the same understanding that God is telling us. There is this standard that there is no point in our lives that we are as good as who we should be. Uh, Don't worry, I was able to get that, uh, that jacket. I eventually became a varsity player. I became a chess player. True story. So I became a chess varsity player. (laughs) Chess is a sports, right? So I became, I got that jacket, right? And uh, my yearbook can show that. (laughs) But man is really totally depraved. That's our our situation, right? On our own, we are not as good as we should be. And that is the biggest challenge that we have. The condition of human is not only total depravity, but also we are powerless and sinful, right? 
uh, one of the, the sad tragedies of our being sinners is that there is a certain powerlessness. Because of the sinful nature of man, uh, there, we, this, is, this is a debilitating disease that we cannot act on our own to overcome and overpower our total depravity. So we become powerless. And look at our, our text for today, I forgot to, to tell you, is, is found in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. And we will be discussing most of these verses, right? Um, we, we say that the writings of, of Paul to the Christians in Rome can be compared to the situation that we have today. You know, during that time, Rome is the seat of power, the seat of civilization, right? The most modern things happen in Rome, and they say one of the things that the Romans did was they, they paved the way for in almost in every countries that they conquered to have a Rome that uh, that uh, have a road that leads to Rome. That's why the expression "all roads lead to Rome," right? Uh, same holds true. We can relate to this. You know, we we live in this country, the United States of America. Maybe people would say this is one of the greatest, if not the greatest, country of all. We are the most civilized nation. We have the, all the the attributes compared to that can be compared to to who the Romans are during their time, and and the understanding and the irony of all roads lead to Rome, and the content of the writings of Paul primarily points to that all or the only road leads to Christ is very ironic. And, and the substance of this writing is very doctrinal. So I would like to encourage you to read uh, the whole book of, of Romans. You know, the first 12 chapters is very doctrinal. You know, from chapter 13, I think, to the, the rest of, of the, um, uh, the, the book, chapter 20, 21, if I'm not mistaken, they are all for Christian living. But we will focus on, on these first 11 verses. And in verses 6 through 8, look at this, right? Uh, you see, Paul is explaining to the Christians in Rome, at just the right time, right? Uh, so it's not early, it's not late, right? Just the right time. When we were still powerless, so that's our situation. That's the human condition, right? The human condition is not that we are, you know, beautiful, that we're powerful, that we're sinless, sinless. It's not that when we, I guess, uh, try to reform ourselves, even if we have total depravity, we try to, you know, to, to make our way up and out of that predicament or that circumstance to become a better person. No, the Scripture is telling us we, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Right? That's the situation. When we were still powerless, when we were still ungodly, when we were still sinful, right? And I like this, this, this next uh, sentence. Very ra- rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Right? Righteous here is, is uh, translated as innocent. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. So Paul is telling us a comparison. So for an in- a righteous person, an innocent person, I don't think someone will try to give his life or her life for that person. Maybe for a good person, because a good person, the word good is defined as useful. If you're a useful person, then maybe, just like Brother Brian, he's a good person. He's also righteous, by the way, right? Uh, Useful, if you're good, the definition of good is if if something serves the purpose for which it exists. For example, my my iPad right now, I've been using this for the last four years, not that I'm asking for a new one, right? Uh, But it's still good. Because it still serves the purpose for which it exists. Once it ceases functioning, when it's not working anymore, it's bad, right? Because it doesn't serve the purpose for which it exists. So the, Paul is telling us, for a righteous person, you know, very ra- rarely, you know, one will give his life for a righteous person. Maybe, maybe for a good person, right? So what does he mean by this? If it's really hard for a righteous person, if it's really even you know, maybe, maybe for a good person, one will give his life. How much more for an ungodly and wicked and powerless person? Why would one give his or her life for that person? Right? Look at this. But God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died 
for us. Can I have a, hear a big amen for this? Amen. 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 Right? amen for this. We were totally depraved. We were powerless and sinful. Yeah, we were not even righteous. We were not even innocent. Maybe some of us, we are good. But most of us, including myself, we are ungodly. We are power, powerless. We were sinful, and yet Christ died for us. Right? This is the situation that we need to understand. And God wants us to know three things about these things. Right? So put this in mind, right? When we are trying to embrace the idea and the understanding and find the answer, why did Jesus suffer? The first thing that we have to, you know, to, to, to understand in the right perspective is from, for us to, to look into the foundation of the, the answer to this question. The fundamental question is who man is, and we are, we are you know, the human condition is we are totally depraved. Right? But there are three things that God wants us to know. Number one, God wants us to know that we are accountable to Him. I am accountable to God. You know, when we hear the word accountable, for the most part, we think uh, this has a negative connotation or understanding. If I'm accountable, then I, may, I need to face some sort of a judgment. You know, this is a negative thing. God, for the most part, we are understanding that God is out to punish us because we are accountable to Him. Right? So, this is a negative thing. But if you look at this very intently, right? Uh, according to what God wants us to understand of who He is and our relationship with Him. Look at this, right? If God wants us to be accountable to Him, it means that we are creatures of significance. Are you following church, right? If we are accountable to Him, then it's telling us that what we're doing is important to God because He wants us to be accountable to Him. And if the things that we're doing is important to God, then we are important to God. Because otherwise, God will not care. Otherwise, God will not be asking us to be accountable to Him. Second church, God is just and God is holy. So these are the basic attributes of a, a God whom we have a relationship with. For the most part, we we have the idea, and it is a true attribute, that God is love, right? God is love. He will always love me. He will always forgive me for who I am and, and forgive me for my sins. But we forget that there are also two other attributes of who God is. God is just, and He is holy, right? Meaning holiness, there is no iota of, of sinfulness or wickedness for who God is. And because... God is just, and because God is holy, God is indignant about sin. God abhors sin because of who He is. His very nature as God. Right? So, so this is the situation. Right? There is this God who is just and holy. There is this God who wants us to be accountable to Him. This, there is this God who is indignant about sin. And the situation of man we are really the, the, the ones that God is indignant about because we are, we are totally depraved. We are powerless. We are sinful. We are wicked. Are we following church, right? So this is the situation. This is the human condition. So how can we, you know, how can we find a solution to this? Right? If, if our goal is, is to, to be with God for all eternity, I hope that's our goal, if, if our understanding is, is to live for eternity and be with this holy God who we know loves us, how are we going to, to go about this? This human condition that is upon us. Our human condition is we are totally depraved and God wants us to be accountable. God is holy and just and God is indignant about sin. The antidote. So, so this is why we need to understand what God did. Right? Uh, the antidote. God's compassion is the antidote to our total depravity. So, we are totally depraved. We are, we are, at no point in our lives, we are as good 
as we can be. Right? And if, if God is the holy and just God, right, how can we reconcile, how can we live for eternity in the glory of God? And look at this, right? In Romans chapter 5, verse 6, the Scripture tells us, I think we, we read this a while back, while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly, right? It, it was while we were still on this condition that we are powerless, it was while we are still in this condition that we are ungodly, that Christ right, suffered and died for us because of God's compassion. Because God needed to do something for our situation because we are powerless. Right? The idea that we are powerless, meaning we cannot do anything about our situation. Have you felt powerless at all in many of the circumstances in life? You know, this is, um, uh, this is quite, you know, a, a challenge for all of us. Sometimes when I look at my life, uh, you know, I evaluate it and uh, with, with a, some sort of a sense of humor, I, I just laugh about things that I thought that I am in control of everything and, you know, and everything in my life. I planned, I am in control. But looking back, there's really nothing in my life that I'm in control of, right? I am powerless even up to this point in some things, in, in most of the things, right? Because God is the sovereign God who controls everything. Right? More so when we are under the power of sin. It's a debilitating disease. The impact in our lives makes us as if we are confined to the point that we are utterly powerless. There is nothing that we can do. And yet, that God did something. And more than that, God loves us so much out of His compassion and love that He let Jesus die on the cross for us. Romans 5.8 But God demonstrates His own love for us while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. The unthinkable, right? Incredible. We say it's incredible, but true. Some things that are very, you know, hard to believe, we, we have this term, incredible. That's incredible. Right? We are so amazed. Right? Things that happen to the point that we say it's, it's awesome, it's incredible, but it is true. God took the initiative right? and said, you know, son or daughter, it is necessary for you to live. It is not necessary for you to live in that condition that you deserve better, right? And my son will take your place on your behalf. So that is the antidote, right? The human condition, and the antidote, right? the situation that we are in, and what God did because of God's compassion, because of God's love, Jesus Christ died for all of us. Third church, right? The outcome. So what happened? Right? What happened when because of our sinfulness, because of our ungodliness, because of our powerlessness, God, out of His compassion and love, sent, gave, his one and only Son, to die for all of us. The outcome, right? We have been justified by Christ's blood. You know, I think we have gone through a series where we understand what justification is, right? Remember this, this, the message, verdict, not guilty. Justified just as if we have not seen. Right? So, uh, at the end of the day, when we face God, right, God sees not you know, an ungodly person, not one that is totally depraved, but because in Romans chapter 5, verse 9, the Scripture tells us, since we have now been justified by His blood. There is this lamb, lamb that took our place right? instead of us. The Scripture tells us the wages of sin, the penalty of sin, is that Christ took it upon Himself. And more than that, Christ washed away our sins by His own blood, right? Uh, if I'm to understand what the cross is all about, uh, I, not, I do not only need to understand my condition, human condition, and, and the divine compassion, the antidote, but it is also paramount, it is also very important to understand the eternal conclusion, the outcome, right? 
the eternal conclusion is this. Right? It is possible for me to be justified by His blood. All that I have done has been blotted out, utterly forgiven. Right? Incredible, but true. Not only that, right? So the outcome, we have been justified. Another outcome, we have been saved from the wrath, wrath of God through Christ. I, I was sharing this with, uh, with our Sunday school, not this Sunday, the last Sunday. Right? So if you are totally depraved and you're not good enough, right, the situation that you are in is you are in a very bad situation because the Scripture tells us that there is only two destinations, eternal destination of man, right? Those who have been justified, those who have passed, those who have been as good as what God asked us to be, the standard of holiness, right? Because He is holy. The reason why our blood, Jesus Christ's blood washed away our sins, so when God looks at us, we are holy, right? So the eternal destination of us for those who are holy, for those who are justified, is to share the glory of heaven. So the question is, what about those, what about those who are not as good or is not good enough? How about those that when God looks, they are not holy, they are not righteous? Are they just going to stay and say, okay, you did not qualify for heaven, that's it, you're not going to get a reward? Church, if you do not get the reward, you will be punished. God's wrath will be upon those who are not as good as they can be. God's wrath will be on those who are not holy, righteous, and justified. Pastor, isn't that unfair? Right? How much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through Him. So that's why it's very important. And that's the reason why Jesus suffered. Right? Because there is no other way for us to be saved from the wrath of God. Right? But by being washed from the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Are, are we following church? Look at this, right? This is very important. We celebrate Easter. Hoping when we celebrate Easter, we understand why Jesus Christ died, we understand that he, he suffered so that we will be able to be justified. We understand that He suffered so that we will be able to be saved from the wrath of God. Just, just the word wrath is very, I don't know what, what to say, but this is not compared to the wrath of man. You, you, you don't say the wrath of man multiplied by so many will equate the wrath of God, right? No, because the wrath of man, there is no basis for the wrath of man, right? The wrath of man actually, um, it's, it's uh, biased. The wrath of man maybe is unrighteous, but I, I like what the, the idea of the wrath of God is. It's a, it's a righteous indignation against evil and sin, right? So that's what the wrath of God is. So if you're evil and if you're sinful, then that's the indignation of God. And the Scripture is telling us that there is eternal punishment for that. And last church, the outcome. Right? And I think this is what we are experiencing. The mo more, most of us here who understand why Jesus suffers or suffered, most of us here who understand that the outcome, that we have been justified, most of us here who, who experience that we are saved from the wrath of God, also are blessed by the gift of the Holy Spirit living within us. Look at this in Romans chapter 5, verse 5. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love, love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Beyond and above everything else, being justified, being saved from God's wrath, right? Now, today, right, we are indwelled by the Holy Spirit of God. So, that's why I, I was probably th very, I guess, uh, uh, enthusiastic and zealous in, upon reading this 
11 verses in, in Romans, if I was Apostle Paul, I would really be encouraged and, and excited writing all of these things. Right? He knew what Jesus did. He knew beyond any reasonable doubt that the Christians in Rome, they are so blessed. They, that this is the blessing that Christ would give to all of them. So, so today, church, right, as, as we come, you know, with, with a few weeks left to celebrate Easter, let us not pass by all of the things that Jesus did, His suffering. Right? In Isaiah 53, He was presented as a suffering servant. Right? Maybe we, we are so hopeful and, and looking forward to the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, the very victorious day. On next Sunday, maybe we, are, we will have a message about tears and, and, and cheers and tears, right? The, the triumphal entry. Uh, but we have to focus as well on what Jesus did and why He did these things for all of us. Why did Jesus suffer? Not until we fully understand the human condition, that of total depravity, meaning at any point in our lives, we are not as good as what or we should be. Right? Can we fully appreciate what God did for us through Christ's death? Church, Jesus suffered for us because He is concerned. He is concerned with us. He doesn't want us to suffer the punishment the eternal punishment that Christ or that God would give us. And, and, and to really answer the question, right, why did Jesus suffer? If for the last 30 minutes I have been speaking and you, maybe you hear something, but you do not really, I guess it doesn't get retained in your, in your thinking, but let me just emphasize and, and answer the question very quickly. In, in a sh short answer. Why did Jesus suffer? Jesus suffered because or so that I will not suffer. Jesus suffered so that you will not suffer. Otherwise, we will all suffer. And I'm hoping we take this right, as we move along towards Easter. Uh, but today, today, if you have realized today right, the reason why Jesus suffered, if you look into yourselves today and you realize that you are helpless, that you are powerless, and you realize today that because of God's compassion, that because of God's love, right, Jesus died for all of us so that we will no longer need to suffer, so that we will be justified, right, so that we will not experience the wrath of God, and so that the Holy Spirit will indwell in us. Right? If we understand this, and more importantly, if we really understand that Jesus suffered so that we would not need to suffer. I think the best and appropriate response to this is to love Jesus back. Wouldn't it be the best appropriate response, right? Mm. And if you have not done that, meaning if you have not accepted who Jesus is in your life, that Jesus gave His life for you as a, your Savior, as your Lord and Savior, and you have not really come and accepted Him in your life today, Next Sunday, we're going to shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And if Jesus is still not the Lord of your life today, you still have time. Today, accept Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life today so that next Sunday, or even this afternoon, you can shout, right? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Church, let's all stand up. Today.